mentioned, I'm here to talk about uh, bioreactor digital twin modeling using uh, you know, computational fluid dynamics tools, in this case from ANSYS. So it's my pleasure to be here as part of this SSPC webinar, and then also on behalf of our ANSYS Elite channel partner, CADPIM. And so, um, you know, just uh, you mentioned a little bit, just so just to give you all a little background on myself. So I joined ANSYS back in 2001, uh, straight out of grad school. Um, I started off as a support engineer for the pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical, and the medical device industry. Um, over the couple decades I've been here, I've always been luck very fortunate to just focus on medical. Um, so I did start off, as I mentioned before, in support and then moved into consulting. And nowadays I have kind of a business and technology development role. Um, I do a lot of work in um, regulatory applications and modeling and simulation, um, uh, also digital transformation. And then finally, um, some work in clinical applications. And then so today we're here to talk a little bit about that uh, digital transformation vertical that I'm working on and some of the work that we've done around bioreactor digital twins. And so as an outline, I'll give you a little bit of background on ANSYS and the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industry, how our technology is used broadly across that industry, um, then go into the technology itself. So what, what does an ANSYS digital twin solution look like? Then we'll go into a, the specific case study around bioreactor digital twins. And then, you know, we're, as you know, we go through this discussion, we're talking about potentially using modeling and simulation as part of operations. So what does that mean from a regulatory perspective? And then finally, we'll conclude. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with ANSYS, I have just a few slides at the beginning to talk about, you know, ANSYS as a company and the technology that we develop. Um, so we've been around for over 50 years now. Um, our simulation technology is used across a wide variety of industries from automotive to aerospace, high tech, um, oil and gas, consumer products, you name it. And then obviously also in the healthcare space as well. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't familiar with how much we've grown, especially since I started at ANSYS, you know, over 20 years ago. So when I, I was hired, I was hired into the fluids team. And I was actually part of another company and came to ANSYS through an acquisition of Fluent Incorporated. Um, and at the time, ANSYS also had the structural modeling and simulation capability, but that was it. Um, but very quickly, we went into, uh, you know, pretty aggressive modeling, or sorry, modeling, I say say modeling, uh, merger and acquisition, you know, phase. So we acquired technology around high frequency and low frequency electromagnetics. We have a semiconductor modeling capability. We also have optical modeling with ZMAX, 3D design, and then photonics. And so this is, you know, a snapshot of kind of the physics-based modeling and simulation tools that we have. Um, if you go up a level, though, you know, what we see from our customers is they want to understand how our technology will help them to understand how their product will behave in the real world. And so to do that, we really need to start combining those technologies. It's very rare we have something that's just structural or just fluids, right? And so we have capabilities we'll see today to model digital twins. Uh, we have system modeling and simulation tools. We have technology for developing and validating embedded software. And then also, you know, data, uh, technology can help, you know, digitize and digitalize your, your um, processes around PERTs, FMEAs, et cetera. Uh, we'll skip over system of systems. This is like a, a aerospace and defense type application around digital mission engineering. But then getting to the platform level, you know, we have technology that can help help manage materials. So think of an enterprise level solution, web-based type interface that's moving the materials, materials data that you have off of your desktop or out of your inbox and into uh, something that's enterprise-based so that the entire organization has awareness and can manage your materials data, which is really critical to performance of everything. Um, something else we jump to the right-hand side of the slide is multi-physics. So again, being able to combine these different technologies together to understand how your um, uh, products will perform in the real world. And because you know, we see more and more of our customers wanting to do multi-physics, those simulations become tougher to do, right? They're, they're bigger simulations. They take longer to run. And so we have a big uh, focus on HPC and cloud. Um, as part of that, then what we see is customers then say, well, I don't want to run just one case. I want to do a DOE. And so that also supports this kind of cloud, you know, the need for the cloud. Um, but as part of the DOE, we, ha we do have DOE tools that allow you to run and optimize your products and processes. And then finally, another issue that we see with, especially with, uh, you know, simulation is just like what we see with materials, where oftentimes material data gets stuck on a desktop. We see simulation data, you know, if you, any simulation folks are out there in the crowd today, it sits on your desktop. How is that data managed? What happens if someone new comes along and wants to run that exact same simulation? Why should they start from scratch? So having a, a process around the simulation work that you do and managing that data is critical. 
Um, so we also have web-based platform for simulation process and data management as well. And then as you go up this table, you can see it's obviously being applied across a variety of different applications and providing solutions across many different industries. And so um, with specifically within the health healthcare space, um, here at Ansys, we uh, break up the healthcare market into four verticals, pharma, biopharma, medical devices and hospital equipment, clinical applications, and then digital twins. And so what we did here was to create, you know, different categories of the types of work that someone might use simulation for within these domains. And then we put a black box around where Ansys has technology. So for example, in pharma and biopharma, we don't have any software technology at this time that can do drug discovery or drug development. But as you, you'll see today, um, we obviously do have a technology platform for drug manufacturing. And then also, we, I won't, I'll have one slide on this, but we also do work in drug delivery. Um, same thing goes, you know, for medical devices and hospital equipment, you can see some of the work we're doing there. I think what's really interesting, just to highlight, you know, in clinical applications, um, we're seeing a lot of interest around surgical planning, clinical decision making, clinical decision support, and how simulation can help that. And so we're doing some work in that space, or our customers or partners are as well. Um, and then finally, digital twins. So we'll see, you know, some work that we're doing around the asset twin today in terms of bioreactor digital twin. But we also see, you know, the healthcare industry moving towards personal digital avatars. So essentially, you know, these digital twins that are following you around and telling you what not to do, right? And telling you how bad, poorly behaved we are and all the bad choices that we make and what they mean for us. So, um, you know, a very exciting time, I think, when it comes to modeling and simulation and really the future of modeling and simulation. Okay, so now transitioning specifically into pharma and biopharma and then mixing, right? So mixing is a core technology for many industries, as you see here. Um, we have a long history of modeling and simulation here at ANSYS, but you know, specifically around uh, modeling mixing for these different industries. Um, I mentioned in the introduction that I started in 2001. Um, as early as 2003, we were creating little apps and wizards that could streamline that mixing setup problem, right? And so get you that first line initial simulation that says, okay, if you want to model like a single phase mixing, you know, kind of streamline the import of CAD, create the uh, volume uh, that incorporate, you know, the volume of the domain, you know, your mixing tank interior, uh, position different elements within the tank, like the shaft and the impeller, baffles, et cetera, and then run simulation, right? And it was a good way to get started. I did find a really, well, I don't say really old, but I did find a picture from the late 90s that showed a mixing analysis that we were performing. But at that time, we weren't quite to the point of creating those apps and wizards. But you can see we already have a decade, you know, two decade history now creating apps and wizards for mixing. So it's something that, you know, we focused on for a very long time. Also to the point where within the ANSYS Learning Hub, which is our technology platform for both live training, but what we find more importantly, self-paced training, um, we do have not only, you know, tutorials that teach you how do I use ANSYS fluids technology or mechanical technology or electrical technology, but how do I apply it, right? Um, so we have a mixing page that takes you through different types of mixers and how to model those. We also have industry specific pages. So I helped to develop with a, a team here uh, internally, a pharmaceutical manufacturing page several years ago. Um, just to highlight one of the tutorials that we have on there, we have a learning path around mixing. And so in this case, it's for bioreactors. And you start off with single phase mixing and just how do I model liquid flow and you know mixing and blend time and it's a tank. And then we go to, okay, now I wanna introduce particles. Maybe those particles are carriers for biologic or for cells, I'm sorry, or maybe they're bubbles moving through the tank. How do those bubbles move around the tank? But using a really simple, just you know particle tracking approach. And then we take you up another level and use Eulerian multiphase to say, okay, now let's get a little more uh, detailed in terms of how we model the interaction between those bubbles and like drag forces with the liquid, et cetera. And, and then next, finally, we have a tutorial around population balance. In that case, what we're able to do is model the interactions, you know, breakup, coalescence, aggregation, et cetera, of those bubbles. Um, and the whole idea of that learning path is as you increase the complexity of that model, hopefully you're also maybe increasing that fidelity of that model and getting towards things like being able to predict KLA with great accuracy, okay? And so then we have a number of different uh, tutorials as well. So, you know, for upstream, downstream processing. So uh, in addition to mixing, you know, we have chromatography, roller compaction, tablet compaction, uh, clean in place, number of other different tutorials, uh, I think really have really been helpful to our customers. And then they can use those tutorials for things like process design and scale up. But we also obviously see, um, you know, uh, tech, ANSYS tech, you know, the fluid dynamics being used as part of troubleshooting and then optimization of a process. 
I won't spend a lot of time. So for the next few slides, I'll talk at a high level about some of the different uh, upstream and downstream processes. Obviously, don't need to spend a lot of time on this one because we're going to talk about this, you know, in just a little bit for our Bioreactor Digital Twin. Um, but just maybe just a sneak preview of the kind of things that you can get from fluid dynamic simulation. Uh, so you could look at tracer analysis and look at things like blend time using, a, you know, the fluid dynamics tool. We can look at how oxygen is introduced into a tank from a sparger and how it mixes throughout the tank. We can also use that to predict things like KLA. Um, if we move to chromatography, one of the things we can model here with CFD, for example, is you know we have a header design that we're dealing with, and we want to understand how that header design impacts the spread of our um, you know liquid throughout the tank and what that means for the separations that we're trying to perform within the column. Um, for lyophilization, we're doing a lot of work these days, uh, understanding you know for example in a very detailed way sublimation that occurs in vials inside of the lyophilization chamber. Um, we're also doing some work, this is more researchy, but trying to look at, okay, what if we actually fill the whole tray up with vials? You know, what does that look like from a heat and mass transfer and flow perspective? Um, at a, a little bit easier level of simulation though, we also have an app for ice lab experiments and kind of modeling equipment qualification. Um, so we are doing quite a bit of work around the lyophilization um, over the last few years. And then finally, drug delivery. Um, so if you do have something where it's device-based, so we're looking at you know, a device like an inhaler and we wanna understand how, part of, how the airflow and particles are moving through that device or modeling uh, delivery from a stent into an artery or even modeling drug delivery into the brain. Um, you know, we can model the, both the performance of the device itself, but then also the interaction with human anatomy and physiology. And that's really the takeaway here. And so for example, I've done a lot of work in the past on drug delivery to the eye. And in this case, these are very detailed models that include, you know, the physiology related to drug delivery. So things like retinochoroid sclera of the eye, uh, the vitreous, uh, you know, anterior chamber, how that drug's moving from a platform throughout the eye and what that means for the, you know, concentration of that drug uh, at the retina over a, you know, at least a two to three month period or maybe potentially a six month period because we want to understand how those implanted device uh, platforms last over, you know, long periods of time. Okay. And then, so finally, a uh, bit of a transition now over into the digital twin discussion. Um, you know, one thing that we've been doing here at ANSYS is trying to demonstrate, you know, how our technology platform can not just be used for the simulations I showed you on the previous slide. You know, things that help us to understand, you know, at a very, you know, detailed level, how is this thing working, right? We want to be more holistic in, you know, the simulations that we're running. And we also want to add more quality to the simulations that we're running. And so that really brings us to this concept of digital transformation. So taking some of the you know, things that we're doing within our organization today that may be manual processes and non-digital, making those digital. And having a big focus now is what we're seeing within our customer base on what's called digital engineering and even model-based systems engineering. And so there's a number of different use cases that you know, we've explored uh, supporting this digital transformation initiative. They range from materials compliance and what I talked about before about having enterprise solutions for your materials data um, to digital system prototyping. In this case, uh, we did a really nice project around insulin pumps. And in that case, we developed a, you know, using our uh, systems modeling platform, a multi-scale, multi-domain, multi-physics model of drug delivery from an insulin pump and even connected that to virtual patients and showed how we can have this more holistic understanding at the system level of how that pump performs. Um, we'll talk a lot today about digital twins, right? So, you know, the next step in using these type of systems models, if they're good enough, we'll turn those into, and we validated them, right? And that's what I mean by good enough, I guess. And we've demonstrated their credibility. We could potentially use those models for digital twins as part of operations. Now, one of the things we have to recognize, though, is if we are going to, you know, use these models as part of our digital twin, we need to understand the provenance of those models. Those models need to be maintained. Um, they need to be, you know, continuously updated and qualified. And that's where simulation process and data management comes in. So we have a you know, focus on this uh, work that we did. In this case, it was, it was back in the COVID days we did this project. So it was on the, um, you know, the, um, you, know, uh, you know, oxygenators and things like this. Um, but we're doing some more work now around model credibility for, you know, spinal implants and other things to demonstrate this with a more current example. Um, also, model-based systems engineering. So in this case, we have requirements that are coming from our systems engineers to talk about, you know, what is what are the needs of our product. And when we when we say model-based systems engineering, that's using computational modeling and simulation to demonstrate the satisfaction of those system-level requirements. Um, you know, experiments are also part of that. We're not saying experiments go away because we need experiments to validate the models. 
But in the end, if we can create validated models, those models can then be deployed to explore more thoroughly the, the design space or parameter space of your product or process, and then show satisfaction of those requirements. So these things don't go away when you say MVSC, things like experimentation, but now we're, we're showing a, a stronger connection between the experiment and the simulation. And then finally, uh, sorry, is there a comment? Someone's unmuted, they may wanna mute themselves. Um, and then finally, um, you know, the, the more the deeper we go into this, right? Even if you get to digital twins, regulatory compliance becomes critical. And so we have a platform based on our SPDM technology. Uh, we have created a template that can be used for demonstrating the compliance of uh, modeling and simulation work that you're doing and can be used as part of submissions. It's specifically around the BNB, ASME BNB 40 standard, if any of you have heard of that. If you haven't, we could maybe have a discussion around that. Um, in the Q&A if I um, leave time, because I'm talking a lot today, I'll try and go a little faster. Um, okay, so now let's jump in. So we're gonna take one of those digital transformation examples I just showed you on the last slide, the one on the bottom right for digital twins. Let's do a deep dive. First, we'll talk about ANSYS technology in this, in this space, because I'm gonna use words, especially Twin Builder, I'll use that a few times, but then we also have this other tool called Twin Deployer. Okay, so what do we mean when we say that? So you'll see you know, some screenshots of it later, but Twin Builder is our platform that we can use to build, validate, and deploy digital twins. And so I have a, a graphic that gives a little more detail later, but when we, when we talk about uh, building digital twins, it allows the integration of technology from many different sources into a one-stop shop that gives us a system representation of whatever product or process we're trying to model. Um, we then have the ability to do optimization and testing uh, to ensure that, that we validate that digital twin model that we've created. And then finally, we have a way to deploy the digital twin itself. And the whole point here with the deployment phase was um, one of the things that we were seeing with our customers as they develop digital twins is how do I get this thing into my industrial Internet of Things platform? I don't know how to do it. Uh, this is becoming a little bit burdensome. Um, and so we, we have a pathway now for creating SDKs that you can deploy to your target um, with very little uh, you know, work being, having to be performed by you, the user. And so what are the, what's the value of digital twins? So when we talk about digital twin, you, you can see a definition for digital twins in the upper right hand corner. I think the main thing to keep in mind um, that when we talk about digital twins is that digital twins are continually being updated by the physical asset that they're intended to represent. If you just create a really detailed model of a, uh, a bio, bioreactor, which some of you may be doing right now or have done in the past, that's nice, but that's it's not a digital twin. That's just a really detailed model of your bioreactor. If you're not continually updating your model with data, then you don't have a digital twin. The next level in digital twin technology is what some folks call digital shadows. And that's where you're sending data over from the physical asset to the digital twin model. But then a human is in the mix and kind of making the final decisions that, that uh, in terms of how we're controlling the process. It's based on the model. And the model is providing some really nice insights. But in the end, the human comes in and makes that final decision. When we talk about digital twin, you know, you're using a, a model for advanced process control. There's online, offline data being sent over the digital twin, the digital twins doing analysis, uh, performing its analytics, et cetera. It's making a, a, a suggestion and maybe someone's in there saying, yeah, that looks right. But in the end, the digital twin is kind of, it, well, there's someone in there monitoring what the digital twin is predicting and what that means for the process. But in the end, really the digital twin has taken over and is kind of running, running the show. And so within manufacturing, there's obviously a number of different benefits for this. And a lot of those are around the, you know, yield in, um, you know, the output of the tank, right? How can we increase yields or the tighter that's coming, ensure consistent uptime of the process, um, add more consistency and predictability of the process. Um, but, you know, really, really it comes back to how do we uh, increase our confidence in the, the process um, and ensure that it's always up and running and running at maximum potential. Um, we also hope when it comes to a product perspective that it does have an impact on quality. Um, so if we are maintaining our, um, you know, our critical process parameters and other quality attributes associated with the drug, then hopefully then, you know, those, all those, uh, uh, you know, critical quality attributes that we have around the drug are being met. And we have more assurance of that because of the digital twin. If we run back into development, um, you know, the other thing that we have been seeing is more and more folks are getting interested in digital twins for scale-up studies. Uh, so can we use the digital twin at the, you know, the lab, pilot, and then plant scale? And then we're also seeing uh, interest in scale down, right? So can we use these digital twin models to get more insights at a smaller scale? 
Um, one thing, uh, well, okay, when it comes to the digital twin itself and what ANSYS provides, you know, we're here in the simulation space of this. So simulation based and hybrid analytics, that's what ANSYS provides. But the point of this slide is to let customers know when they, they decide they want to go down this digital twin pathway, is that when it comes to the other elements of this, so the I, IoT elements, edge platforms, you know, managing your assets, infrastructure, you know, data transfer, data storage, you know, the analytics that are being performed in the cloud, et cetera, you're not on your own. We already have an ecosystem that's been created with, you know, uh, various partners. So you do have some choice in terms of the partners you want to work with. And actually, I, I shouldn't put it that way. We have provided you with some partners that you can choose from or you can choose your own. You're not limited in any way by the partners you work with. These are just ones that we already have existing, um, you know, a, a, an existing foundation with so that hopefully you're not, you, know, you don't feel like you're on your own when it comes to actually deploying the digital twin that you've created and validated it. So what are the, some of the insights that we can get from this? Um, you know, when it comes to digital twins, one thing that we get are so-called virtual or soft or software sensors. Um, so, you know, within a process, you may have fixed sensors that are providing information to you about, you know, pH, et cetera. There may also be, you know, offline measurements that you're doing for information around biomass, right? Um, but these are point measurements taken at specific, you know, points in time and then also points in space. And so the question is, you know, what else can we get from a simulation? Well, you know, as, uh, as you saw in some of the previous panels and images I showed you, simulation provides you very detailed information around things like flow patterns, what are the mixing patterns in the tank? We can predict, you know, uh, when we combine these models, let's say a metabolic model of cells, as we'll see in a little while, now we have information around, you know, substrate concentration in the tank, uh, you know, what's the titer, what's biomass at any point in time within our, our operation. Um, we can also get information out of the fluid dynamics around uh, fluid dynamics model around blood time, blend time and mass transfer coefficient. So suddenly, you know, we get this world of information that wasn't available to us before from our, you know, helpful but limited online and offline measurements. Um, we'll see today the, op, you know, operations and how it could impact potentially optimization, but also provide us assurance that the operation is performing as it's expected. Um, we can also generate that baseline, but also what's critical is failure data. Um, so one of the limitations I think that probably most of us on the phone know is that if we create a purely data-based approach to our um, digital twin, then the second we move outside that validation space where we trained our AI or machine learning tool for you know the digital twin, um, the credibility of that, that that prediction falls off pretty much very quickly. And so if we have developed a physics-based model based on data or even a hybrid model that's based on data, if we start to extrapolate outside of that validation space, then we have more confidence in the predictions that are being made because they're underpinned by physics. It's not to say that physics is always right, because that's the last impression I'll give you. Validation is critical, but at least with the physics underlying it, it gives us a little more confidence if we do move outside that validation space. And then obviously with the digital twin, we can, you know, uh, freeze we want, you know, we can perform DOEs and virtual DOEs or what have you and start to do what if and trade-off studies with the model. That would be very expensive to do if we wanted to do those, you know, in the in the um, manufacturing plant. Okay, so this is a cartoon screenshot of our twin builder workflow, and just the whole idea here is to give you an idea of what kind of information can we incorporate into our digital twin. First and foremost, you can incorporate, you know, solver solvers, right? So all the various physical solvers we have at Ansys, and then even external. So we we like to say with the digital twin work that we do that we're an open uh, technology platform they can incorporate data from many ecosystems so we understand we can't be everything to everyone and therefore to really be able to create and deploy digital twins we have to have this you know this is a key requirement to be open um, but you know the the solver technology from ANSYS or others can be incorporated um, we can also incorporate reduced order models so one of the things that I think a lot of us on the phone might appreciate <laughs> is that if we want to run a 3d model of a mixing tank in real time that's going to be very difficult to do and so often what we find is that we're running, um, you know, DOEs, right, uh, mixing uh, within the operating space, you know, across different parameters and then creating a reduced order model that represents things like KLA as a function of agitation rate of the impeller and how fast we're introducing gas into the tank. So we'll run those simulations as a DOE here on the validated physics side, create a, a reduced order model and put that in. And now we're suddenly able to run these things very fast and basically faster than real time. Um, we can also include the object-oriented language. So in the example that we'll see later, we can include, you know, code and really code up, uh, you know, 
additional capability into the tool. For example, in the example you'll see in a little bit, we use Medelica to create a metabolic model for the cells and how they're um, creating product using substrate, et cetera, within the tank. Okay, so we have our digital twin model here. Um, I mentioned to you before that, well, it's great to have that model, but how, how do I deploy that to the cloud or edge environment? Um, so we also have this tool called Twin Deployer, which can help with that. So essentially, as I mentioned before, it's creating that software development kit that, that all the code that you need that captures the behavior that we're showing here into a, 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 a container that can then be deployed to the cloud. Okay, so now let's jump into our use case, Digital Twin for Bioreactor. Um, so I'm running a little bit behind. I think I talked a little bit about this um, in the previous slides, but you know the digital twin specifically for our bioreactor provides virtual sensors that can tell us um, you know things in great detail, even bubble size and bubble distribution throughout the tank. And some of that you're seeing right here. Uh, we can get the variation in dissolved O2 throughout the entire tank, and that can help us to then calculate uh, KLA. We can optimize our operations. So by predicting mixing time, we can potentially you know, make changes to, for example, the impeller speed to you know, get that mixing time where we want it. We can help with pH regulation, et cetera. So um, now let's jump into the digital twin model that we created. So I, for the next slide or two, I think I have cartoons that kind of take you through what we developed here. So you have an understanding at a high level, you know, what's being created, and then we'll jump into the technology itself. Okay. So um, on the left-hand side of this slide, uh, um, okay, so for the digital twin, it had two uh, different elements. It had a bioreactor process model and then a met metabolic model for the cells. For the bioreactor process model, that's a three-dimensional model and it's steady state. Whereas for the metabolic model, that's a zero-dimensional model. So we just have a lumped representation of things like biomass, pH, et cetera, throughout the entire tank. So we're assuming the mixing, tank, mixing time and blend time is happening much faster than other processes within the tank but that model is transient, okay? In terms of the outputs from the bioreactor process model, we're modeling both the liquid and the gas phase. Um, so we get things like flow patterns and then O2 concentration in the liquid phase. And then the gas phase, we get the gas bubble distribution from the model, okay? So in this model, we're bubbling gas into the gas phase from a sparger, and then that, that uh, gas is diffusing into the liquid phase. Now in the metabolic model, the outputs on the liquid phase are things like cell concentration, product concentration, substrate concentration. We also get pH as you see below. And then there's nothing in the gas phase. So nothing about you know, what we're doing on the metabolic model or the cells is hopefully in, inside an oxygen bubble, right? Um, and then this is just a selection on the left-hand side of some of the equations that we're solving. It's much more involved than this, but I don't wanna do death by equations anyway. You know, Navier-Stokes equations, turbulent equations, et cetera. And then we're doing some stuff around uh, population balance modeling uh, to understand how, that, how the gas bubble size evolves throughout the tank. Um, on the biomass side, or sorry, on the metabolic side, this is basically all the equations we're solving. So we have these uh, first order ODEs that tell us you know, how biomass, pH, product, and substrate evolve over time. Um, there is one more equation though, and that's the equation that brings these two domains together. So we really want this connection between what's happening in the, in the process model and the metabolic model. And what brings those two uh, you know, domains together is oxygen, right? So we have KLA, so that's a prediction for how fast we're transferring oxygen from the gas phase to liquid phase inside the tank. And so um, normally in the old ANSYS days, this would be the entire model that we would provide for you. But you know, more and more over the past few years, we've been getting into this metabolic side of things. And now we're able to uh, not only give information about the source of oxygen in the tank, but then the sink that's occurring where cells are taking up that oxygen through the uptake rate, okay? So now we have a little bit more of a holistic model and understanding of what's happening inside the tank because we're combining these two different um, domains together. And so um, this slide just takes you through the workflow and what we did. So for a while I was having a hard time even picturing to myself how all this comes together. So hopefully this slide, you know, while it's just super descriptive, gives you an idea of what we're about to go through in developing this digital twin. Um, so step one, bioreactor process model. We need to develop our mechanistic model. Then we need to validate it. Then we need to develop the reduced order model that will go in the digital twin and we need to validate that. Okay, so what you'll see today is we did all those things. Now, when it comes to the compartment model or the metabolic model for the cells, we developed that me mechanistic model. I didn't really have validation data. And then, you know, a big part of my work is around validation. So I didn't want to cheat because then people call me out on it. Um, so anyway, I left that box empty. 
Um, it's okay though, you know, it was developed based on a number of papers that I was reading around um, penicillin production. So that seems to be a really nice starting point, I think, when folks are getting the metabolic modeling. And it's also something that we could share publicly. Now, the metabolic model runs so quickly that I didn't need to create a reduced order model for that. So we just didn't even bother. Okay. Now we need to bring those two domains together, right? We got to combine the, mod the metabolic models with the process model. So we developed that digital twin model. You'll see that. And we deployed the digital twin model. You'll see that as well. But because I was missing this one check mark here, I didn't give myself a check mark there. Anyway, I think what you'll see hopefully is that you know we're getting through a lot of this process in terms of developing, validating, and deploying digital twins. Okay, so we have a bioreactor process model. This is based on some work by Laconin et al. So we've been working with them for several years and had already put in quite a bit of effort um, around some work that they had done in looking at uh, sparging into a mixing tank. So in this case, um, you know, they had, uh, you know, just your standard kind of, I guess, round bottom tank. Um, this just gives you some of the details in terms of the mesh and operating conditions and boundary conditions that we applied within the tank. Um, but the main point here is just pretty standard in terms of, you know, some of what we were doing, at, um, you know, from a mixing perspective. Um, the real value, real value of this work and the fact that we already kind of had this in our back pocket is that we'd already done quite a bit of work in terms of validation of, of the mixing environment inside this tank. And so um, what you see here are, are some representations of the particle diameter within the tank. So we get these really nice 3D contour plots that tell us what's the you know, particle diameter at different locations in the tank. Um, Laconin was able to measure the particle diameter at different locations, either visually or through a sensor. And so what we see is that we have really nice agreement between the experiment and simulation in terms of the particle diameters, uh, you know, at different locations throughout the tank. So already we feel like this is pretty big success in terms of the model. Um, the other thing that we were able to do is look at this at, a, at the more, you know, tank level. And so the, the other information that we had is, you know, the uh, holdup within the tank as a function of how fast we're sparging gas into the tank as well as hold up as a function of agitation rate of the impeller, okay? And so what you see is we do a pretty nice job predicting these, um, but there are some gaps. Um, currently, so I went with this, you know, in terms of the digital twin project that you'll see today, but I am working internally with one of our other engineers here. We do have a hybrid modeling capability where we can learn these gaps and add even more fidelity to the predictions that we're making based on the ROMs. Um, so maybe that's a TBD or something here in the near future that we could share with you all. Um, but that's where we're headed next is, you know, your options are to either improve the model so that we reduce the difference between these uh, data points or take a hybrid modeling approach. Um, so we're going to actually work our way through both and kind of evaluate on our own, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of each. Okay, so now we have developed in terms of that cartoon I showed you, we've developed the computational model, that 3D physics model that tells us what's happening in terms of mixing and gas sparging throughout the tank. Now we need to develop our response surface, our ROM, okay? Because we want to run this in real time. We need a reduced order model to do that. And so what we did was to uh, sample the operating space of this bioreactor. And so we have a variation in the agitation rate of the impeller from 300 RPM to 500 RPM. And then we're, you know, this is a normalized value for how fast we're sparging gas in the tank. So it varies from zero to one, okay? And so the round circles show you locations where we ran a DOE. And then we also have triangles on this plot that show you where we tested the ROM that we created after we ran the DOE. So the whole, the idea here is we have these 25 learning points. We run those simulations, we create the response surface from those, and then we run five more simulations of those triangle points and compare the results of those five simulations to the prediction from the reduced order model, okay? And then we, we calculate the difference between those. And so what we see is the overall difference between those for, um, you know, the KLA and gas holdup is less than 4%, um, but we do see some differences there. And so it's something where we might examine, like, I don't know what's going on with point C, so that's something we could look at because really that's an outlier in terms of the predictions from the other, you know, points on that response surface. Um, we had initially had a point that was way out here as well to kind of illustrate how poorly, um, you know, kind of database models perform once you get out here, but then I said, well, it just makes more sense to look at the interior. Um, so anyway, you know, maybe there's something we can do in terms of examining or going a little closer into this point to see what's happening. And maybe we need to add a couple more uh, learning points here. But that's what you can kind of start to learn when you go into this um, analysis is, you know, what's wrong and how do we do better in terms of uh, improving the response surface? Because really the response surface is now our model 
and it's representing the, the CFD. And so we completely wiped out the CFD and this is our new model that represents the tank performance from a fluid dynamics perspective. And so this is exactly what the ROM looks like here. So we have you know, the volume rate of gas that's being introduced into the tank and the agitation rate of the impeller's inputs and the output of that model is the KLO. Okay, so that's a reduced order model. Next step then is to create the compartmental model for the cell. So I already showed you these equations and then there's also the dissolved oxygen equation. So what we did was take advantage of the Medellica modeling capabilities within our twin builder environment um, and just you know, create this code. So if I zoom up on it really quickly, uh, Medellica is really easy in terms of um, implementing ODEs and then it has a solver for solving those ODEs and providing the results. I'm pretty sure this is all the code associated with that metabolic model I showed you. Maybe there's a few more lines at the end. Um, uh, so anyway, it's very straightforward to essentially, you know, set up and solve these types of problems within the Medellica environment. What's also really nice is, as I mentioned before, we don't need a reduced order model for Medellica. This code runs so quickly, um, it just doesn't slow down the process at all. Um, so the next step then is to give you a screenshot of our final digital twin model and twin builder. I do apologize. This screenshot also looks a little bit cartoony because I forgot to screenshot the menu bar at the top, but this is a screenshot of twin builder. Okay. And so what it shows is we have our bioreactor ROM here. So this is the, C the reduced order model representing our CFD simulations of the design space. We have our compartmental model for the, for the uh, metabolics. Sorry. Yeah, we have our metabolic model here that represents it, um, you know, the code that I showed you on the last slide for Medellica. And so this, these are the guts of it. These are, these are the you know, simulations that we're running. But then these are connected upstream. Uh, one, we have gas flow rate and agitation rate data coming into the digital twin. And then we have controllers. And the goal of the controllers, in this case, we set one goal, and that was to keep the dissolved oxygen concentration above a certain level within the tank. And as long as you do that, then we were generally happy. There's certain goals that you can have and you can incorporate into your digital twin model. We just had the one for now. So we wanted to stay above 95% oxygen saturation in the tank. Okay, um, so then the last step of this was to set up a web app. Um, so I'll show you that on the next slide. But you know how that web app is operating is we have CSV files that are inputting the how fast we're uh, spinning the impeller and introducing oxygen into the tank. And that's going to then be running the digital twin model and we'll see the outputs of that um, right now. Okay, so I'm gonna hit play on this video. And so this is a dashboard that we created, really simple dashboard in-house, just to kind of show this is how you know we could start to um, analyze the system, right? So on the top of this dashboard, we have plots that show how fast the impeller is spinning, and then we also have how fast we're, um, oh, sorry, the, the left side's uh, the rate at which we're introducing gas into the tank, and then the right side's the impeller. Then on the bottom, we're looking at the dissolved oxygen concentration. One is based on a controlled process and the other is uncontrolled. So you'll see, you'll be able to figure out in just a little while which one is the digital twin and which one is not. All right, we'll see that in just a minute. Um, the other things you can include in the dashboard are things like measurement data that's coming off of sensors that are inside the tank. You can put the controller outputs that are on the model as well as now virtual sensors. And those virtual sensors then are giving us information away from the actual sensors that we have or additional information that may not be easy to collect you know, dynamically over time. So for example, things like biomass. Um, so now what we're gonna see in just a second is that we have an interruption in the gas flow into our tank. And what happens next, um, you know, when the digital twin model then takes over? Okay, so we have this sudden reduction of the gas flow rate. Um, and now it's like, uh-oh, we're in trouble. You know, we're not going to be able to deliver the oxygen to the cells that they need to, to survive. And so with the digital twin model, realizes is it says, okay, well, this is a non-digital twin. It just, the tank just keeps doing its thing and hoping someone comes along and helps. Um, but then we have the digital twin model that said, you know what, if I increase the agitation rate of the impeller, that's gonna increase my KLA. So I'll take those big bubbles are in the tank and I'm gonna chop them up into small bubbles. And then that's gonna reduce or increase, sorry, the interfacial area and then increase KLA. And it's gonna get me above that limit where I, or above that threshold that I required for my minimum dissolved oxygen concentration. On the first one to admit you can't do that forever and then cells might be sensitive so obviously you know this this data point was within the operating space so it is an acceptable uh, option in this case to increase our rpm um, but you can see now the the digital twin is bridging this gap between the time that we lost o2 and then hopefully the time that we recover the o2 feed to the tank so you'll see in just a second that the o2 feed it does get is recovered 
we start feeding oxygen back into the tank again. And then these two curves will start to come back into alignment with each other. They won't be exactly overlapping. They, they eventually do kind of get back together, but history matters. So the way they get there is kind of a little different. So you'll see this one recovers, but now we have a quality event that we're really, someone's gonna really wanna dig into versus the one, the upper green line, where maybe someone's gonna look at this and say, okay, I guess we should check this out. But if you never left your operating space, even though the oxygen was um, interrupt, the oxygen flow was interrupted. It seems the cells had enough oxygen to survive. You know, the the few minutes or you know seconds that this occurred over. So maybe there's less scrutiny over what happened here. Okay, and that's the goal: one to optimize operations, but also in case there are faults to mitigate and manage those. Last thing we'll get into is the regulatory consideration. So, um, you know, I, I I've done a lot of work in the device space to to help to develop a framework around the acceptance of modeling and simulation with regulatory authorities and not just me i mean i'm working with fda industry uh and other industry service providers etc and there's a large group of us has been working to establish a pathway um, because one of the issues we're running into in the device space is that um, bench test and i'm sure many of you know this on the phone bench testing animal testing clinical trials are well accepted they're the go-to sources of evidence for establishing safety and effectiveness of devices around the world right and so computer modeling and simulation, uh, ever since I've been at ANSYS, was always a question mark. You know, can we use modeling and simulation as part of regulatory submissions? Well, as of 2018, with the publication of the ASME BNB40 standard, the answer is yes. In the United States, we have an established regulatory framework for using modeling and simulation and what some folks call digital evidence as part of regulatory submissions. Okay. And so the question then is what happens, you know, now, now that we have this really well established uh, framework for the acceptance of modeling and simulation in, uh, for knowledge based models in the US, what does that mean elsewhere, you know? Um, the other question is how about you know, pharmaceutical manufacturing and then also AI and machine learning? Um, so if we look at this chart here, you know, we have knowledge based models on the left, we have database models on the right, we have devices on the top, drugs on the bottom. So knowledge based models, we get a big check mark, we're doing really well in terms of the acceptance of these models. Um, you know, for uh, support, of, uh, you know, safety and efficacy decisions for medical devices here in the U.S. Um, the FDA recently published a discussion paper around the use of AI and software as a medical device. So something that's still under discussion, what are the best, practice or best practices for establishing the credibility of AI and ML um, information? On the drug side, there's a ICH document that talks about modeling and simulation. I think a lot of you on the phone are probably familiar with it. And at least it says, you know, for the models that you're using, you know, there's a low risk, the low, medium, high risk uh, discussion that you have to have. And based on that, that's going to dictate how much validation work you have to do. And I will tell you that the ASME BNB40 standard and all the FDA, um, uh, FDA um, approaches also match that. It's risk based in terms of how much validation work you have to do. On the, uh, you know, on the AI, AI and drug manufacturing side of things, um, there's still questions around validation. How do we appropriately validate these computational models? FDA published a discussion paper around this called Artificial Intelligence and Drug Manufacturing a little less than a year ago. And some of you may also be familiar with the FRAME initiative around advanced manufacturing and AI falls under that, you know, in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we assess these models? Um, in Europe, there's also a, a recently published document from February um, from, gosh, I can't remember the name of the group, but uh, they also publish a document and they're looking for information, right? So EMA is looking for in information around how do we assess the, uh, the, the credibility of computational models that are used as, pharma as part of pharmaceutical manufacturing. It's a very short paper. It goes by really quickly, um, but they do take a risk-based approach and they also say, you know, help us out in terms of you know, providing feedback uh, in terms of what are the best practices. And so um, this one, what's really interesting as well, I shifted it over a little to the right. They talk about both, you know, knowledge-based and database models in that paper. So lo looks like they're trying to sort it all out, maybe in one shot, if possible. Um, the last thing I'll highlight for you in terms of my slides uh, before we get to the conclusions and Q&A is that there is a ASME subcommittee focused on verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification and computational modeling of pharmaceutical products. Um, this subcommittee has been in existence for exactly a year now. Um, and so it's a group of us who are trying to answer these questions around what are the best validation practices um, for these types of computational models. If we do say in here, process development, manufacturing and drug delivery in our charter, I can tell you right now that the primary focus is around uh, process development and manufacturing. And in fact, we're working on a kind of discussion paper, if you will, right now, that will publish as a peer reviewed journal article 
kind of talking about what are, are some of our best practices that we see today and what's the future of kind of VBUQ in this space. If anyone's interested, definitely let me know because it's it's an area where, you know, really this is supposed to be, uh, you know, the industry opinion on what, what are the opportunities and what are the best practices. So with that, I'm kind of gone long on time. I don't know how many questions there are. So I can, I think, you know, we kind of been through a lot of this as part of the discussion today. Um, but we talked about, you know, digital twin solutions and how they can, you know, get information from a variety of different sources, uh, how we facilitate the creation of runtimes through twin deployer, um, that field data can help us in making hybrid digital twins. And then this, obviously the regulatory element of this is critical. So I don't want to spend too much time. And so we do have some time for Q&A. So with that, I'll say thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for that really detailed discussion on digital twins and, and the value that computationalized modeling brings to the pharma and med device sector.